You're listening to the King of the Fourth podcast, offering in-depth analysis on all things Boston Celtics with your hosts, Jim and Mike Quigley. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a Friday morning after a big Celtics win to force a game seven out in Philadelphia. A lot to discuss. Tatum struggles throughout the game, uh, taken off late. Um, the addition of Rob Williams and going double bigs into the starting lineup and how the, that affected Philadelphia offensively and what that means for game seven, what Philadelphia did to attack that late and what they might try to do in game seven to attack that. Um, but, you know, I think the biggest takeaway, and we do have Mike back, although my, Mike sounds a bit like Mike Malone this morning, so you're going to have to bear with him. He doesn't have much of a voice. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. It's a great little- morning. Great morning. I think the biggest thing, Mike, you know, for me is that they went in and um, they fought for a victory in a game where, you know, they had 18 turnovers. They shot the three well late and to start, but in, you know, from the second and third and to late into the fourth, not well at all. Tatum wasn't going, Mike, um, but they defended and, um, you know, players like Smart, White, Brogdon and Rob Williams really stepped up for them. Um, where other players, you know, Brown included, Tatum struggled, um, and Horford struggled offensively. So they, they they figured it out. They fought. They fought. They fought. And I, I think that's the biggest takeaway. And they're still alive because they fought. Yeah, it was an experience. <clears throat> Yesterday was, I mean, it was just an experience. I, like no other. This game, I can't think of many games that were like yesterday where. Um, Prior to the game, when they said Missoula was going to go double big, I felt really, really good about the Celtics' chances. And I was really confident they were going to win. And they came out early, and it looked like a great adjustment, and it was working, and the defense was really, really effective, and the Celtics got out to a lead. Um, And in the back of my mind, I'm like, all right, Tatum's 0 for 4, 0 for 5, but the defense is so good right now. He's active defensively. He's finding guys, passing the ball. You know, we might be okay. And when that second quarter hit, that's when, like, the Jason Tatum experience last night really started because I was so concerned that he lost the series in that sequence. He went to a lot of iso ball where he was missing shots, he was forcing, he had some bad turnovers. I, I couldn't believe that the lead was still seven when we hit halftime because I felt like Philly needed to be closer. So even going into that third quarter, I was thinking. <coughs> yeah, they, Smart they had a huge play to end the half where he right. forced the steal, recovered the steal, and got the layup at, um, when things were un- unraveling there at the end of the second quarter. And that, by the end of the third quarter, I was so frustrated with Tatum. That, you know, I it's like I, I was at the point where I was saying, you can't play him. Like he's turned into Ben Simmons. You can't yeah. play him. Yeah, and I mean, um, and you yeah. were texting me and you were saying, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. And like, I took a second to think about it. I was like, yeah, Jimmy's right. That's a stupid thing. They have to play Tatum. And I thought the second coaching adjustment in that game by Missoula that made a big difference in the victory. And it's small, but I thought it was impactful. To start that fourth quarter, they ran a play to Tatum and he got to the free throw line. He hit both free throws. And I think that impacted his shot at the end of the game. Yeah, no, I thought that was that was important. Um, but you're right, it was it was just a roller coaster of the game. And I I, I thought it was over, Mike. When Philadelphia kind of grabbed that momentum in the third quarter, um, you know, Celtics jump out to a 10-point lead in the third and Doc calls a timeout and he immediately subs out P.J. Tucker because, you know, like what was happening in the first half when P.J. Tucker was in with Rob, when the Celtics double bigs, um, Rob was just allowed to roam off Tucker in the corner and things were really congested every time and be touched the ball. The Celtics were able to cover the side pick and roll a lot differently where Al doesn't, doesn't have to drop as, as quite as much. Jalen can cheat more because he knows he has Rob in the back. And so they went away from that, went to Embiid on the high post, and Rob's help just even, you know, disrupted that. 
And so they they take Rob, they take out PJ Tucker, right? And they, you know, they went to Melton and um, the Celtics to adjust. They put Robin and Bead, and they immediately put Robin to action. Um, you know, they st- they run the side pick and roll. Rob d- drops too deep. B gets an easy little jump shot from inside the foul line. Next time down, they run the pick and roll again. Rob, um, you know, his drop is kind of weird. And he picks up Hodden, then just lets him go, and Hodden gets an easy layup. And when Brown tries to recover, he follows him. So it's an AM one. So you go from 10 to 5 in a blink of an eye. Um, so, you know, at which point the, the Celtics sub out Missoula. They, Missoula subs out Rob instead of, you know, adjusting him defensively. And, you know, all the momentum kind of goes to Philly. You know, they really just go on a run and they take a lead by two at about before the end of the quarter's over. I think they even got maybe went up as much as five. And it just felt like it was it was, you know, the Celtic season was kind of circling around the drain at that point. And when yeah, you really into, did. Yeah, when you went into the fourth and Tatum had that really bad uh turnover with Embiid when the Celtics had a chance to get out and run, he went to go for a three, left his feet. And Embiid was right there to contest on the, the fast break. Instead of attacking Embiid, it was just a really poor decision. And then his foul on the um, breakaway. Oh, that foul, was so bad. You know, yeah. that, that had a potential to be a five-point play. If, you know, Philly hits a three after the free throws, um, Celtics defend well and they get the stop. But it, it just didn't have the feel like um, – it was going the Celtics' way at that point. It, it, yeah, I mean, but go ahead. But the Celtics' defense in that fourth quarter—I mean, they were just so connected. Oh for yeah, the majority of that quarter. I mean, you could never get away. And I mean, there was so much attention to detail that even like when Harden was driving to the basket, and the Celtics were swiping at the ball, they were they were getting all ball, and the refs weren't calling those bullshit fouls. And, like, even on the inbound with 1.7 seconds left on the shot clock, Philly ran a great inbound play for where they were, from where they were passing the ball in. Like, Harden made a great inbound pass. Yeah, but it was to Milton for a fadeaway. Yeah, got it to Milton for a fadeaway, and the Celtics were all over it. Like, all over it. Um, I just felt like that entire fourth quarter, I mean, they held Philadelphia to 13 points. It's, uh, the defense won them the game, and then obviously Tatum took over with just an incredible fourth quarter performance. Yeah, no, he won for the he, ages if they win the series. He, he was really good, and so you know, the Celtics did go back to double bigs, and again, the the Sixers took out Tucker, and, and so this is the implication of this. Either the, I think of the Celtics going double big in this game. They take out Tucker. They design a. Philly comes down, designs a play where they get um, Maxi in the corner. Hey Jim, I think you want to you want to start over and clean that up because it was all. I no, all it's good drunk. on my end. It's good on my end. So oh, okay, yeah. So Maxi gets in the corner, and Rob does a poor job of closing too quick and pump fake through penetration. Maxi goes into the score. From that point, Rob goes up. But the key now is that Tucker is out of the game. And Tuck has really been a force defensively on uh, both Tatum and Brown, um, yes. you know, in, in causing havoc with doubles and things like that. So Tatum goes on this, you know, run at the end of the game, and they were down two when he hits that three over and beat in the corner, which was not an easy shot, by the way. Uh, and beat contested it pretty well. Tatum hits that, and they go up two. But from that point on, Tatum's feeling good and free, and there is no plus defender on him anymore, like there was for the majority of the game. Because they, the Sixers didn't want to go back to Tucker because they knew if they did, Rob was coming back in the game. Oh, that's interesting. So they they stuck with Niang, uh, and I think he closed the game, or maybe they went to Melton after the, the three-minute mark, but Niang's in the game. And, and this... And, Tatum is just, you know, his next step back on Max, it's on Maxi, you know, which he can shoot over and Maxi can't stay with him anyway. That's right. 
Yep. And then the third one is, you know, the you got two defenders and Maxi and Melton coming off the screen. And Maxi gets confused and Tatum just, you know, pops off and gets, you know, they end up double and smart and Tatum's wide open. So you, you ended up having at the end of the game, the Celtics were able to take advantage of their best defender being off the court because they didn't want to bring him back in because of the havoc Rob was causing when he was on the court. And it really wow. kind of puts wow. the, six, the Sixers in a little bit of a bind for game seven on how they're going to address this. I think Tuck has really been key in defending Brown and Tatum. I think he's taken one away almost um, this whole series. He's, you know, he's been better than I thought he could be. Um, and without him, they're just not the same team defensively. And so how do they attack that? Um, you now, the one thing that ends up happening is they are better offensive. They get more offensive weapons on the floor. So they can, you know, maybe it's more free-flowing for them. Um, you know, they didn't ne- neglect, they did neglect to get him beat the, the ball at all over the last four minutes, which is, you know, <laughs> it's pretty bad. If you're Philly, I don't know how that happens, especially with Rob out of the game and you had a chance for him to go one-on-one, but you, you saw it essentially got Tatum out of jail. Um, in a lot of ways, he needed to make that first shot. If he doesn't make that first shot, I mean, it's a worthy gamble. If he, he doesn't make that first shot, then who knows? But he made that first shot, and then he was out of jail without really a tough defender on him. So, you 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 know, even with Rob out of the game, you see the impact. And um, it's going to be interesting to see how the Sixers adjust for Game 7 um, because, you know, I imagine Rob will start. Do they start Tucker or do they, you know, do they go smaller? Do they start Niang? Um, you know, Doc has two days to contemplate that. but. You know, we did talk about on the last pod that well, I think I think so. in closeout games because he doesn't adjust to the adjustment, and we saw a bit of that last night. Yeah, Jim, that was a really good breakdown. Um, by the way, that you just did, like that was really good. I think I think something that's hurt the sixes in what you're bringing up, and it just kind of clicked with me, is the ineffectiveness of McDaniel's. Yeah, because that's a guy that if Tucker can't be in the game that you would look to, I would think, um, because he's a, he's supposed to be as good as a shooter as the Yang, who's a much better defender. And that's part of the reason they brought him in. I don't know if it's been an all season thing, but certainly in the series, he's, he's offered them zero. Um, I don't know if this would be a really bad idea for the sixes, but I was thinking, um, if you wanted to, no, it doesn't make sense because you want Tucker in for his defense. But I thought maybe you could match up with the Celtics by going double big yourself with Reed and Embiid because Embiid's such a, a forceful jump shooter from foul line extended um, that you could just try to beat the Celtics up inside because Reed's been so good. But I think it shrinks the floor for you too much and yeah. also allows Tatum go, to go off against Harris. It makes it really easy for Rob. Too. I mean, if it was yeah. just put Paul Reed in the dunker spot, it, like he doesn't really have to do anything at all. And then, well, I think also what it does is it just, it, you know, it really gives the Celtics matchups they want all over the floor offensively, you know, because uh, both, you know, Embiid's okay, but he's not a good perimeter defender. Paul Reed's not a perimeter defender at all. And it, it just puts them in, in some tough spots, I think, on the other end. Yeah, I think I think an adjustment for Philly is, um, you know, James Harden can't go four for eighteen from the floor. No, if if James, if James Harden is hitting shots, because Maxi, we know he's coming to play, right? So, um, but if Harden if Harden's hitting his outside shot and is hitting his three, then then this is a much different conversation, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's both Harden and Tatum were, you know, really poor shooters throughout this game. And and I think both teams can look at this and say, wow, you know, those guys just, you know, play to average. Sixers think they win. Celtics think they win going away. So, you know, those are the ebbs and flows. And I, I think for Harden, he's an older player. It's every other day. He's getting two days rest now which is significant. Uh, yep. Him and it be two both. days yep. rest now. 
Um, you, you know, I think the difference between him and Maxi is, you know, Maxi's 22, so that playing every other day is probably, you know, not that big of a deal on him. Um, but it's, you know, I, I, I this give Missoula credit. The switch to go double bigs really affected uh, Philly. Um, you know, the, and it inspired the Celtics, and I got the I think opened up things offensively too, for you know. For the Celtics in that in that first quarter, in particular, you know, you anytime Rob drove the lane, if you know, off a roll, it felt like he was drawing two guys to help, and you know, then if the Celtics were able to drive off that. There was always a man open for three, and so they yeah. were getting really good looks early, and I think a lot of that had to do with Rob's pressure he was putting on the rim. Um, exactly. I wonder why they didn't go to this earlier in the series. Um, I. I don't think Rob has been effective when he's been the only big out there versus Embiid. Um, I think he's really struggled with that. And yeah. I think that's a combination of coming back from injury and him having to switch just really isn't his style. I always thought this was a good team if Rob was right and he appears to be right to go double bigs first. And and you kind of, Michael, it was interesting. I don't know if you stayed up and watched the players' comments last night, but both Brown and Smart, really alluded to that. I mean, Smart even said at one point, it really caught my um, ear, you know, Joe's gotten criticism and rightfully so. And I think he was referring to like not going to Rob. Um, the players, I think, really love it when he's out there because they know what he brings. The coaching staff obviously felt something was much different. And, um, you know, maybe this is a one-off, but it, you you see the havoc he he can bring to a game, and I, I don't oh, think he's as good as last year right now. Still, but you, even that this version of Rob brings havoc. Yeah, this can't be a one off, especially in this series. And I think against Miami too. You you have Kevin Love in the game. You go, you double picks against them. You're gonna dominate. Yeah, well, Rob, um, and I'm gonna talk, Mike, because you so you're in a bad area. But you can just see, like, his ability to get out on okay. shooters. He doesn't have to be one pass away. You know, like, he, we we would laugh at the Cornette contest, contest during the season because he'd be two, three passes away and he jumps straight in the air. Rob could be two passes away and actually get a contest out there. Um, not a great one, but enough to have a seven-footer jumping high into your airspace. It has to have some effect on your shot. And especially when you're, you know, not a great shooter like a PJ Tucker or, or, or DeAnthony Melton that can, that can affect you. Um, and, you know, I think you look at this, this game, it was ugly. The Celtics got some help from the Sixers. The Sixers definitely missed open shots. They didn't go to Embiid the last four minutes of the game. Celtics didn't always help themselves. So offensively, 18 turnovers, the way Tatum played, but you know, they all rebounded from 50 to 35, fast break points. They were ahead three pointers. They outshot them 15 to eight. So, uh, you know, 40 attempts, I don't think is enough. I think you probably need more than that in game seven. Um, so they fought. It wasn't a clean game. It wasn't their best game. They can play better. And Mike, with that in mind, what do you expect to see in game seven? Do you have any feel on what game seven might look like? Absolutely not. I have no idea what to expect with this team. So I'm just going to go with, you know, my history of watching game sevens in general. I think people will be tight. I think it's going to be intense. I think the defense is going to play a huge factor on both ends. I have a feeling the refs are going to let a lot of things go. Um, and it's going to come down to players making tough shots in tight coverage. It's going to come down to guys making tough plays. And I feel like it favors the Celtics because overall the Celtics have a much deeper bench. They can have more chances of guys getting hot than Philly does. Philly really depends on three guys with very little support. Yeah. I, I think what Mike was saying is you have, um, Philly depended on three good players, really good players, and Maxi and B and and um and Harden. 
I, I think Philly's a good defensive team. I think this is, a, you know, two days rest for Hodden, two days rest for Embiid. It, it really matters that they, they're going to feel fresh, Hodden and Embiid, ready to go. And so to your point, Mike, those three players, even though they're not getting a lot of help, they, they can certainly impact this game almost on their own. How much do you weigh experience in this game? So the Sixers, you know, they get some season playoff guys. Um, collectively, they haven't played a game seven together. Obviously, the Celtics team has been in this spot before. Um, and also, you know, how much do you put in to the fact that the Celtics have not played well at home over the two seasons in the playoffs? And what does that matter? Mike, do we are you there? Mike, you're on mute. But I think, you know, so I think on those two issues, the Celtics, um, I mean the Sixers, I think that experience not being together does kind of matter out there. And Bede and Harden and their time in game sevens have not had a lot of success. Doc hasn't had a lot of success. So I I, I do think that matters to an extent. Um, you also see a lot of times in game seven, you know, an unlikely figure like a Grant Williams or Kelly Olenek really rise to the occasion, especially for a home team. I think it's a lot easier to play at home in these games than it is for the road um, team. And, and so that's where the Celtics have an advantage. And the Celtics fans, and I'm going to close with this. We, Jalen Brown called you out last night to get loud and be into the game. And I understand that in game five, they didn't get fans a lot of reasons to cheer, but there was a lot of empty seats early. Um, the crowd was not into it at tip off like they should have been for game five. I thought the Atlanta series, the crowds just was okay. I thought in games one and two, the crowd was just okay. Um, I know it's Mother's Day. I know you have responsibilities. But get to your seat early, you know, get over to Sully's before the game and have a few and get nice and um, lubricated and ready to go. As a, you need to make this, you need to make the Sixers fail you. You need James Harden to fail you. Uh, he's a guy with a history that hasn't been great here. So come out ready. You have a responsibility. They got to game seven. Now you got to do your job. Um, and be as loud as you can and, and impact this game as much as you can, um, even when things seem to be struggling. So with that, hey, we weren't sure we'd have uh, another game to talk about. The Celtics are still alive. And if they get through uh, Sunday, they are the clear-cut favorite to win the NBA title. Um, we'll talk to you soon. Um, and hopefully it's after uh, it's, it's prepping for the Eastern Conference Finals.